Horst, we're very lucky to have you here. Thank you very much for joining us. Great to be here. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, Moritz, so yeah, you were uh, the, the one who started it all. You were the first minimally invasive cardiac surgery fellow here in Houston sure. Methodist. Yeah. How was that experience like? It was great. You know, I mean, I was specifically looking to acquire a, the skill set uh, of a minimal invasive heart surgeon and with a, you know, focus on valve work, but then really expanding into all the other avenues and, and, and just... I think uh, curiosity to push the envelope and, and, and do something a little bit different, have an edge. Yeah. And that's, you know, definitely what I found in the field of minimal ways of cardiac surgery. So yeah. It's been great. You've definitely made a, main, a name for yourself in the field. I mean, people, I've seen you like present at podiums in all types of conferences. So congratulations to you for that. Yeah. Thank you. you were at the ACC recently. I was at the ACC. Yeah, it was great. Um, we're talking about all things, you know, in the world of transcatheter therapies mm -hmm. and, and all the other pathologies that uh, still occur in the setting of, for example, the aortic valve stenosis. Yes. You know, a lot of patients now getting transcatheter therapies, but oftentimes having multiple other issues, valve lesions, AFib, and so mm -hmm. forth. And I think just the importance of not forgetting about all that and, you know, yeah. taking a wholesome, if you will, approach to our yeah. patients and make sure we don't leave any pathology on the table. No, you're absolutely right about this because it's not just a single pathology that you're treating. You're treating the whole patient and the patient comes with their own comorbidities and it's just not one thing that you're treating. So kudos to you on that. So you started uh, as an I6 resident. Were you one of the first I6 residents in the country? Yeah, it was, um, I think, the second year that I6 programs even opened in the United States. Mm -hmm. Extremely lucky, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I worked hard to get to that point, but I would be amiss to say it was all just my hard work. It was, you know, mentors that, uh, you know, made it possible for me to even apply to these programs as a foreign medical graduate. You mm -hmm. know, it's a, a stiff competition. I think at the time there were six positions across, six or seven positions across the United States. That Is were, that right? That were open. Wow. Wow. And so, you know, it, it, it was definitely um, a competitive environment. I'll tell you, though, you know, probably today I wouldn't even have a chance anymore applying because yeah. it's gotten even more competitive. It's and unbelievable. I, I, I think Some of the CVs that I've read recently, oh, my God. Unbelievable. It, it's it's mm -hmm. impressive. And mm -hmm. I, I think it's exciting to see that. Absolutely. Because we do need, you know, all these smart people in mm -hmm. our field. Um, contrary to popular belief, I think cardiac surgery is more alive and exciting than ever before, and it's getting more challenging. And Absolutely. so I, I think, you know, having more people being attracted to the field again is, is terrific. More women, more uh, people of all kinds of backgrounds, yeah. diversifying our workforce, um, something that is just super exciting to see. Yeah. So what led you to cardiac surgery? I'm sure you've been asked that question many times, but why cardiac surgery in particular? Yeah, I have a super boring story around that. Let's and you know, like most people, not most people, but a lot of people you ask, it was like, you know, did you always know that you wanted to be a doctor or a surgeon? And, and that's a, yeah, when I was five years old. And it, it's been none of that for me, honestly. I, I didn't even know I wanted to go to medical school. And, mm -hmm. and I was torn between medical school and law school, believe it or not. Wow. And what ultimately, I think, really got me going in, in the field of medicine and, and medical school was learning. Learning has always been a passion of mine and, and constantly learning and exploring. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not being paid by North Face, but if yeah. I had to pick one slogan, then it would be never stop exploring. Yeah. And that is so true to, you know, who I am as a person, my identity. Mm -hmm. That That's what gets me up in the morning is exploring, mm -hmm. learning, exploring new things. And the beauty of medicine and heart surgery and all the things we do is that it's not exact science, so the yes. learning never stops. Yes. So it it's truly a, a endless game. You know, it's mm -hmm. a it's a it's a a game that will never stop. And I think that's what all yeah. got me so excited about it. I mean, you've been in the field of innovation; uh, you've been leading it. So, what are some of the uh, innovative, the new innovations that you're seeing in the field of heart surgery right now? Yeah, I think in some ways it's a you know cultural shift that get me most excited about mm. what we see happening now. Mm. Cardiac surgeons never really had much competition mm -hmm. um, because there wasn't much of an alternative. Sure. And cardiac surgery as a field isn't even that old, right? Mm -hmm. And with the advent of new technology, as is common true uh, it, it, it will at some point start replace technology will start replacing 
technique or a skill set. Indeed. And I, I, I don't think that's entirely true um, as a concept, but obviously in cardiac surgery, we have seen a dramatic shift in the space of structural heart valve disease with isolated aortic valve replacements becoming less and less commonplace um, and more more transcatheter aortic valve replacements being done. And with that um, trend, there's definitely been much more excitement, mm -hmm. much more proactive engagement of surgeons mm -hmm. in the field of innovation. Also the companies, you know, that the industry that works in that space, it, it was sort of a service industry to the yeah. heart surgeons. The heart surgeons had a specific need that mm -hmm. they needed met they had a mm. specific problem we need a valve so they mm. developed the valve but now with with all, everything that's going on it's just a, a much more engaging much more scientifically driven field and i think that's what gets me most excited Absolutely. about the future of cardiac surgery that's right it's all about evolving right now you know we can't be doing things that we've been doing for the past 30 years or 40 years and i've seen such a dramatic shift in the way uh, surgeons are trained right now with the advent of transcatheter devices because it is something that we need to be heavily involved in as well not just for our own personal sake, but for the patient's sakes as well. What do you say about that? Yeah, I, mm -hmm. you know, I think we owe it to our patients to constantly learn and evolve in, in medicine as a yeah. field. Medicine as a field, again, is, is actually, despite sort of what sometimes people think, looking at it from the outside is fast-paced mm -hmm. in terms of the, the, the discoveries, the, the technological advancements that we see. And there is a, a need to keep up with that. And, and that's always a balance when you are a procedural person, right? You, you learn a specific way of doing something and you want to stick to that. So mm -hmm. you have predictable outcomes. So mm -hmm. there is an element of being true to what you have done for a long time and then on the flip side of it you want to balance that with yeah. you know exploring new techniques new technology new concepts so you're not getting stuck in one place where you might be doing excellent work and very reproducible high quality work but you're not moving with the field. Absolutely. And so I think it, it's that tension between the two of those that can be very exciting too. Yeah. I mean, we're speaking about evolution, but let's talk about re-evolution, which is sure. why you're here. You're one of the faculty this year at the Re-Evolution Summit. Um, this is one of the biggest premier uh, minimally invasive cardiac surgery courses in the world. And uh, how do you see training in the future? Uh, for new graduates, new residents, what do you see? It should minimally invasive cardiac surgery and transcatheter be a part of regular training because there's so much to learn in open cardiac surgery. How do we find that balance to make the ultimate futuristic cardiac surgery resident? Yeah, I think, you know, the you're spot on, right? I mean, first of all, it's exciting to be here at Re-Evolution Summit. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, you know, really kudos to Dr. Ramshandani. <clears throat> And the team here at Houston Methodist that have done this for now 15 years? Yeah, 13 years. 30, 13 years. Mm -hmm. And really, as you say, I think it's the best hands-on training course in minimal invasive cardiac surgery that I've come across. And, and for those who are not familiar with it or have not been here before, th there's a lot of workshops out there. There's a lot of other societies that do similar things, but this is truly fully immersive two days hands-on training with some of the best faculty in minimal invasive cardiac surgery, mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of learning going on. Mm -hmm. And so it's an incredible platform. It's an incredible platform here with the facilities that are at our disposals here to do the teaching. And as you said, I think there's such a big need in 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 cardiac surgery to keep up, to to innovate, to evolve. And cardiac surgery is tough because it's an extremely high stakes um, environment on a time, on a, on clamp time. Yes. Right? So it's not only it's high stakes, it's, uh, you know, small, you're running against the clock. Small, Absolutely. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Small things can have like huge, huge consequences. consequences. No, we're also doing it on the clock mm -hmm. and like every minute counts. Absolutely. And that is that is a very um, tense environment. And, mm -hmm. and so naturally, people want to play it safe. Mm -hmm. We owe that to our patients. We have to play it safe. And so the question naturally comes up, how do we train surgeons 
the next generation, the, the current generation of surgeons to adopt some of these newer techniques, yeah. to get into these fields of transcatheter technology, to be part. And ultimately, I believe it's, you know, technical skills. Yes, and technical skills and hands-on training like we have here. But ultimately, I also think it's embracing a much more um, inclusive, yes. if you will, environment across cardiovascular disease. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is one of the biggest struggles in healthcare is how siloed things are. Sure. They're, you know, each of these components in the heart and vascular space, cardiology, heart surgery, vascular surgery, still tend to be too siloed. Yes. And and we have to break down these silos and we have to collaborate and work together more. And I think that's where the field is headed, right? Mm. I, I think the future is that it doesn't matter if you're a cardiac surgeon, cardiologist, or vascular surgeon. As a team, you just take care of these patients mm. and do the very best you can and everybody rallies together. And not just surgeons, APPs, yep. nurses, administration, Everybody across the board have to sort of buy in. And that's that's what we see too, right? That's we see, okay. we see um, heart and vascular centers popping up. That's not a new concept. I mean, yeah. that's a well-established, you know, structure and processes mm-hmm. that we well, well know from the cancer, mm-hmm. you know, centers that are very prominent and well-known, right? An entire hospital just for cancer patients. Yes. Right? Not 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 this and that, just cancer patients, but everybody under one roof working together. Mm-hmm. And I think in in the cardiovascular space, that is increasingly recognized. Yes. And I think that's what's gonna get us to a point where mm-hmm. more people are more familiar and collaborate in a better way mm-hmm. around patients in need of heart and vascular care. Absolutely. I mean, you mentioned that cardiac surgery is such a high stack, high stakes game. So I'll just ask you a human element of this. How do you stay grounded in these kind of situations? How did you learn to be patient and, you know, stay yeah, grounded? Yeah, I, mm-hmm. again, you know, this is, it, I, I said, it's a, my, what is my passion? You yeah. know, if I, if I reduce my person to one thing, it's, mm-hmm. it's learning and exploring and how to deal with this, with the stress and pressure, I, th- I think that's a lifelong journey mm-hmm. for all of us. And it's important that we don't forget about that. Yes. There's a lot of talk about wellness and, mm-hmm. and we have a lot of complex societal issues to solve around mm-hmm. our workforce, how the mm-hmm. workforce is changing, things we have to do to accommodate a more um, sustainable model of, mm-hmm. of taking care of our heart and vascular patients mm-hmm. to be more inclusive. Yes. And, you know, the ability to sustain all that pressure to take someone who is crashing and burning to the OR and get them out of the OR alive. No one is born with that. Yeah. We, we all learn that. Unfortunately, we learn most of that in isolation and we're not doing a good job about sharing more about the strategies that have or have not worked. We don't, I think, pay enough attention uh, to, you know, uh, mental wellness, well, you know, well, just well-being. Mm -hmm. And there's some of it in societies at meetings and and people, I think, increasingly start talking about Mm -hmm. that. But it has traditionally been, uh, you know, survival of the fittest. Yeah. Those who, who had done it well, they'd succeeded and the yeah. others less so. Mm-hmm. And we all know the stories of people who crack. Burnt out, yeah. Absolutely. Burn out, crack mm-hmm. under the pressure. And, mm-hmm. and I will say, you know, cracking under the pressure can take two forms, silently drifting away mm-hmm. or the surgeon that throws a scalpel <laughs> in the OR. Yeah. Equally bad, right? Mm-hmm. We, we want none of that. And, y- you know, as a as a as a as a society, group, yeah. as mm-hmm. a group, as surgeons, we need to do a better job mm-hmm. to help everyone navigate that mm-hmm. space. And I think all of us struggle with it. Mm-hmm. And for all of us, it's a lifelong learning mm-hmm. to stay balanced and grounded. Mm-hmm. For me, you know, things outside the work environment are incredibly important, as everybody yeah. will tell you. Yeah. Um, and there's not there's nothing magic or special that I do. Um, but we have to 
we have to equip, I would say, young surgeons also with better tools mm-hmm. to to address this. And as mentors and educators, we have to, I believe, increasingly be more cognizant of these issues mm-hmm. and help young generation of surgeons navigate yeah. that field so we can retain them and not end mm-hmm. up with uh, a number of people that mm-hmm. enter the field with a lot of enthusiasm yeah. and then unfortunately walk away from it. Yeah. So you've attended the Revolution Summit many times and many times you've been here as a faculty. What's your favorite part about it? What, what message would you want to give somebody who would potentially want to attend this? Yeah, I think it's two things. Mm-hmm. Community and then I almost... Always, like every year I walk away with like some little tidbit, like mm-hmm. like something I change, you know, not grow, grow, I'm not going to do my mitral valve repairs differently or mm-hmm. any of that. But there's always like some technical things. This mm-hmm. morning I was talking with Kazim, a mm-hmm. good friend of ours, mm-hmm. and he said he stopped using um, Pluravac drains for mm-hmm. his chest tubes. He just mm-hmm. uses a bulb drain. Yeah. Like this is ridiculous. And then we talked about it and stuff. So Every year I come here, mm-hmm. there's like something I take. I've, I've, I've done minimal invasive work now for eight plus mm-hmm. years. Mm-hmm. And every year I take something away. Yeah. Um, in, in a break, I was talking with Mario Castillo saying mm-hmm. about instruments and, you know, something we've noted about a, a specific instrument that always gets caught in the yeah. court. Yeah. And it's like, this should be changed. So it's, it's that process of exchange with, with peers. Mm. It's um, the community. Mm. It's learning something. Mm. And then also, you know, seeing new surgeons adopting it and showing up excited, wanting to change their practice, wanting to do something mm. new. Um, I, I think it's tremendous. I really appreciate you for coming out today from your busy schedule because you're, you're definitely going to be busy in the lab today. So uh, thank you very much, Morris. Thank you for having us. And thank you for, thank you for being here and uh, being a part of the Revolution Summit every year. We can always count on you. Thank well, you so much. Thank you, Sia. It's been a tremendous pleasure talking with you. You obviously have a very, very bright future ahead thank of you. you. You're a fantastic surgeon. I'm pretty excited it. to see everything you accomplished. Thank you very much. And I hope we can stay together, stay friends and stay together. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Pleasure.